Welcome to my guide for computer forensics. We are doing the book Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigations. We're using the fifth edition. This is chapter four, Processing Crime and Incident Scenes. So our main objective is to explain the rules for controlling digital evidence, describe how to collect the evidence at a private sector incident scene that's going to be different from a public sector or could be different, Explain the guideline for processing law enforcement crime scenes. Again, that's going to be more public sector based. List the steps in preparing for an evidence search and describe how to secure a computer incident or crime scene. We're also going to be looking at explaining the guidelines for seizing digital evidence at a scene. List the procedures for storing that digital evidence. Explain how to obtain a digital hash and review a case to identify requirements and plan for our investigation. So those are gonna be our overall objectives for this class or for this chapter. Let's go ahead and what is digital evidence? Um, so sadly, when we talk about digital evidence, most people think, well, flash drives, photos, emails, things of that nature, but it's more than that. Digital evidence is defined as any information stored or transmitted in a digital or electronic form. The US courts accept digital evidence as physical evidence. The uh, US court does not differentiate between the two. Digital or physical evidence, it's all the same. Digital data is treated as a tangible object. That's important because as we start getting later down in some of our chapters, certain things are classified intangible, and thus if we're not able to analyze them or touch them, then they're not really admissible. Where digital evidence is classified tangible and is treated such as physical evidence, even if we can't touch it. So the interesting thing is there's groups out there that kind of help define these. So there's a group such as the Scientific Work Group on Digital Evidence, SWGDE, they're one of the main bodies that set standards for the recovering, preserving, and examination of such digital evidence. They're one of the main groups out there that set these standards. All right, so what are some of the tasks that you may be uh, geared to, uh, to do while performing your investigation, while working specifically with digital evidence? So normally we're doing things such as identifying digital information or artifacts that can be used as evidence. One of the nice things is we're collecting things and what we are classifying, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna collect everything and we're gonna analyze it so it will all be classified as evidence. We're going to collect, preserve, and document everything so that if we come across certain documents or photos or artifacts and they do eventually turn into evidence, we have collected and preserved them in such a way, in such of a manner that can be used. Because again, we may not always see the larger photo or the larger picture. We're collecting data. We're collecting something that another person, an investigator, could be us as well, could then, once they have all the pieces, start looking at our data and start slowly turning that into information. But again, the initial stage we may not view it as evidence when all we're doing is mass collecting everything and seeing kind of what it can turn into. For example, we may see a photo on the desktop and it may be of a kid, for example. You know, first thought could be, okay, that's a photo of the suspect's child, no big deal. But if it's a case on child sexual abuse, well, that may be could that could be child pornography. So we don't know without the appropriate context. So we document everything, and we're going to treat it as evidence until we can rule it out. So we've collected, preserved, documented, analyzed, identified, and organized. Next, we may have to rebuild evidence or repeat a situation to verify that the results can be reproduced reliably. That's one of the big things is when you do this, not that we're not trustworthy, but repeatability or the ability to reproduce is extremely important because 
we always want a way to verify or having someone else verify our work just in case. That's part of the scientific method that we're going to be employing. So again, collecting of that evidence or that digital devices and processing a criminal or incident scene must be done systematically, step by step, that's repeatable. Again, that's where we start going back to that scientific method. You lay out a plan, step A, B, C, D, and you follow through A, B, C, D, and you process it, or process it one section at a time. You process it step by step. That's documented. So we have to understand a few of the rules of evidence. So consistent practices will help us to verify our work and enhance our credibility. Because again, if we're always doing the same things over and over, and it's always the same steps, it builds on our credibility. I, when I get in my car, always check my mirrors. I double check uh, my blind spots. I check my lights. And if I do it every time, someone really can't question, well, what, did you do that? Because that's a known habit. I always do those same practices. The car, the mirrors, it's just an example. But when you're consistent, it builds to your credibility. Comply with the appropriate state regulations. So you will have federal regulations, you'll have state regulations, you may have county regulations, you may have ordinances, you may have torts, you may have uh, case laws, you may have very specific rules in your area. You have to comply with all of them. So the next common question I get is, well, how do I do that? Well, one of the problems is an individual investigator may not know all the rules, but that's why you're part of a team. You normally get with your teammates, normally a lawyer, because that's their area of expertise. So you're going to follow the rules that they kind of outlined because, again, they typically know what's acceptable and, not, and what you can and cannot do. Because evidence admitting in a criminal case can be used in a civil case and vice versa, we have to be able to collect the evidence in such a way where the courts will not toss it out because we collected it or stored it or we did something wrong with it that made it no longer viable or inadmissible. One of the big things is keep current on the latest rulings and directives on collecting, processing, storing, and admitting digital evidence. Again, this is typically for a team, not an individual, because you're going to have a, you should have a lawyer on uh, your team that is current on all of the rulings. Because again, as things change, as laws change, as ordinances change, as our political systems changes, so could our rulings on specific items such as evidence collection. Data you discover from a forensics examination falls under your state rule of evidence, or it could be part of the federal rules of investigation. It depends on your state and the jurisdiction. Again, always verify with law, or not, not with law, with a lawyer so that we can verify. Digital evidence is unlike other physical evidence because it can be changed more easily. Physical evidence is hard to minimize harder to manipulate where digital evidence is a lot easier to manipulate so that a few extra precautions that must be in place. The only way to detect these changes is to compare the original data with the duplicate because it, remember we are typically not working off the original data we are working off of a bitstream copy which is a hundred percent copy of the original thus we can always compare our working copy with the original to verify. Most federal courts have interpreted computer records as hearsay evidence, so that is something that to keep in mind. Hearsay evidence has a very distinct rules that can be applied in the court system. Hearsay is also typically defined as secondhand or indirect evidence. So again, state court will accept it as physical evidence, Federal courts treat it more like hearsay, and again, that may change depending on, well, the time. So one of the interesting things is with federal courts, sometimes they may do business record exemptions. 
Basically, what that means is they allow the record of regularly conducted business as direct evidence, not hearsay. So things like business memos, reports, records, or data compila uh, compilations. So, I mean, again, it's going to be, honestly, it's going to change. And one of the big things is recognizing that you need to have a lawyer on your team that is going to stay current with some of this because laws and regulations and case laws and torts and all that good stuff change regularly. Generally, digital records are considered admissible if they qualify as a business record. But I mean, again, that's going to be based off of the definition of a digital record and based off the definition of a business record and may or may not be admissible. Double check. Court records, sorry, computer records are usually divided into two major groups, computer generated and computer stored. The computer can generate logs, and that's different from information that the computer just stores. So do keep that in mind. Computers and digital uh, stored records must be shown to be authentic and trustworthy. Part of that is building that trustworthiness, showing that they were not um, tampered with to be admitted into evidence. So computer-generated records are considered authentic if the program that created the output is functioning correctly and then also possibly verified functioning correctly. Usually considered as an exception to hearsay rule, that's always really interesting, because again, it's computer-generated, thus it's more direct, not indirect. We're collecting evidence according to the proper steps of evidence controls help to ensure that the computer evidence is still classified as authentic. And that may change. Because again, depending on the process that you use to collect it, it may change that computer evidence, whether it be uh, computer generated or computer stored. The classification of that data collected could be changed to non-authentic, thus no longer admissible or possibly still authentic, but the court may view it as hearsay and then not allow it. When an attorney, when an attorney challenges digital evidence, often they raise the issue of whether the computer generated reports were altered or damaged, or if they can bring up to the point where it was feasible that it was not collected in a way, thus allowing it to be altered and or damaged. One test is to prove that computer stored records are authentic is to demonstrate that a specific person created that record. And that's a little bit harder. I mean, it's really easy to do. That's one of those harder things to prove because again, it, did the user that created the record, did they have an account? Was it password protected? Did someone have access to his password? Some states don't even care about that. If a user generated the report, then it's fine. Where other states will look at, if the user generated the report, but there was no password, how can we verify that the uh, person that said they created the report or that the account that really generated the report was really that person if there was no password? Because that password allows only someone that knows that password to log in and create the report. So there's this giant cluster mess of additional things that could be there to prove or to demonstrate that that user really created that report. The author of a Microsoft Word document can be identified using its metadata. But again, if there was no password to the computer and you logged into it, and again, you had no password, I could generate a Word document on your computer because I was able to get on it, and then it would be owned by you or it would be identified as you being the author because again, I was using your version of Word. So you can always view the metadata typically by looking at properties. Our author, or the publisher in that case, here is the properties for Chapter 4's PowerPoint. Here's where it's currently saved. Here's the date, its modification, last time I accessed it. What I really care about is this detail, so. It's Chapter 4. The author is Course Technology. It was last saved by that person. Here's the revision number. It's being opened by Microsoft PowerPoint. Content created. Last time it was saved or updated. 
Total editing time. Word count, paragraph count, slides, additional information, more my specific details, and then my computer who I own it. But here right here is the important part, the origin of it. So that's what I mean by metadata. So the process of establishing digital evidence trustworthiness originates with the written documents and the best evidence rule. Typically, the best evidence rule states to prove the content of a written document, recording, or photograph. Ordinarily, the original writing, recording, or photograph is required. Though that's not always the case. Copies sometimes work as long as we're able to prove the metadata has not been tampered with. Some metadata also includes things such as GPS coordinates. So when you post a photo on Facebook, for example, if you don't scrub the metadata off of it, it could actually you be posting it with the additional content that you did not know was there. Federal rules of evidence do allow for duplicate instead of originals when it is being uh, produced by the same impressions as the original. How does that work with an a electronic copying? That gets a little bit more complicated. If we're copying it and it's verifiable, 100% identical, then we can treat it as such, even though we know it's a copy. As long as a bitstream copy of the data is created and maintained properly, we can use data found off of that as admissible. The copies can be admitted in court, although they aren't considered the best evidence. But again, we're not working off the original, we're working off a duplicate of it, as long as it's a bitstream copy. An example of not being able to use the original evidence, investigation involving a network server, uh, removing a server from the network to acquire the evidence that could cause harm to a business or to its owner, or other things where the law prevents us from removing digital evidence or honestly so that's what always kills me with this honestly it could just be as simple as your state mandates you do not work off original you work off copies as long as it's fair verifiable a bitstream copying then you should be okay the private sector organizations could include businesses and government agencies that aren't involved with law enforcement. So we could have government sectored organizations that are not part of law enforcement. We could also have non-government uh, non organizations, NGO, and they're gonna have to comply with the state public disclosure and federal Freedom of Information Act laws, FIOA. Because again, non-government organizations they still have to comply with the appropriate state regulations. Basically, the uh, Freedom of Information Act allows citizens to request copies of public documents uh, created by federal agencies. Normally, if we're dealing with organizations, they're not going to be created with federal agencies. They're going to be created with public or uh, private information private sector organizations, but if those private sector jobs have a legal requirement, if they have a legal requirement to post public documents, you can always get this public document as freedom of information. Some organizations must meet SOX, for example, SOX, that mandates that a lot of their financial information is kept public. A special category of private sector businesses does include ISP or ISPs and other telecom organizations. ISPs can investigate computer abuse committed by their employees, but not by their customers, except for activities that are deemed to create an emergency situation. One of their customers is threatening to make a bomb and they're looking up how to make a bomb and then starting to order the parts on how to make a bomb, then the ISP can act. Investigating and controlling computer incident scenes in the corporate environment is a little bit harder. 
normally private organizations have a little bit more politics to them, but I mean, it depends on what you're comparing it to. It is a lot easier than in a criminal environment once you have the federal government and the state government involved makes it a lot harder. Typically, the incident scenes is often a workplace as opposed to a different type of crime scene. Typically, businesses have an inventory database of computer hardware and software that is allowed and approved and or licensed for. And you can use this to help identify computer forensics tools so that we can analyze those databases for possible policy violations. Corporate policy states uh, statements about misuse of digital assets should be adhered to. Basically, allows the corporate investigator to conduct covert surveillance with little or no cause. Because again, as long as the corporate policy states that, then it should not be a problem. Also, they should be able to access company systems without a warrant. Because again, this should all be internal. Not external, but internal. You're going to have internal staff doing this. But that way you can have employees that could be being an, under investigation without having to notify the employee that they're under investigation. So that's where warning banners and things of that nature come into play. Because again, normally businesses will display a warning banner and publish policies that clearly outline the policies, procedures that uh, are governed by it. That way they can tell you that all the information on the computers that they own they are subject to search at any time and that you are okay with it. Because again, it could be a written policy and a procedure. Typically, a company that displays that type of published policy, they're going, it's going to say something to the extent of that they reserve the right to inspect assets at will. Corporate investigators should know under what circumstances they can examine the employee's computer. Again, they may be working internally with the appropriate internal policy person, verifying that legally they're allowed to do the search. Again, it's a team. Every organization must have a well-defined process describing how an investigation can be initiated and the scope and work through of the type of investigation. It's not just a willy-nilly, just out of, the, out of the blue. It needs to be something that is well-defined, well set up. If a corporate investigator finds an employee is committing or has committed a crime, the employer can file a criminal complaint, again, with the police. The employer usually is interested in enforcing a internal organizational policy, not criminal action. Because again, if there's criminal action taking place by the employee, the police would be involved and it would no longer be just an internal review. So the corporate investigators are therefore primarily concerned with protecting of company assets, company items, companies, IP, equipment, and such. So if you discover evidence of a crime during a company policy investigation, you need to think of a few things. Determine whether the incident meets the elements of a criminal law or if it actually uh, is broken as a, a criminal law. Inform management of the incident. Stop your investigation to make sure you don't violate the Fourth Amendment restrictions on obtaining evidence. Work with the corporate attorney or general counsel to figure out how to apply or how to respond to such violation. You may then get the police involved if general counsel says it's appropriate. But I thought what was really interesting is once you're doing your investigation and you've noticed evidence of a crime, you stop your investigation. It no longer is a company policy investigation, but now more of a criminal investigation. Thus, you must comply with more heavily uh, documented laws, rules, regulations, torts, things of that nature. Because again, you notice they bring up the Fourth Amendment because in a criminal case, there are very specific items for search and seizure. So you must be familiar with the criminal rules of a search and seizure. If you don't, maybe you're 
again, your teammates might, your lawyer, because again, you have to adhere to those rules. You should also understand how a search warrant works and what do they do when they process one. Again, maybe not you, but someone on your team. Understand that law enforcement officers may search for and seize criminal evidence only after probable cause. And then again, probable cause is nice, well uh, defined as well. This refers to the standard of specifying whether a police officer has the right to make an arrest, conduct a personal or property search, or obtain a warrant for arrest. Typical probable cause is defined, and that's going to be defined per state, so you kind of want to make sure that you're doing the definition of probable cause based off of your state. And that could be as simple as being reasonable grounds for making action. And that action could be, again, the search, uh, an arrest, or obtain information. With probable cause, a police officer can obtain a search warrant from a judge if they have uh, likelihood. Again, if they have that probable cause. The judge will make a decision and then either grant or deny such search warrant. That authorizes a search and possible seizure of specific evidence related to that criminal complaint. Again, search warrant is going to have a very specific scope that you'll have to follow. The Fourth Amendment states that only warrants particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized can be issued. Big thing there is, again, understanding that the search warrants are going to have scope and you must adhere to the, that scope of that search warrant. Understanding the uh, concept uh, inside a search warrant, something is uh, called the innocent information. That's going to be things that are unrelated information that does not deal with the warrant itself. It often excludes or is excluded with the evidence you're trying to recover. So you may find things that may not be part of the evidence that you're going to be using, but you just you collect it. And if it turns out not to be part of that investigation, but it's still part of the scope, you can exclude it because it will be unrelated information, thus turning it into innocent information. Typically, judges often issue a limiting uh, or a limiting phrase to the warrant. Again, very defined scope. This allows the police to separate innocent information from evidence. Sometimes you may not have to, to collect it as evidence. Sometimes it will just be unrelated information, thus not being able to seize it. There's also a few doctrines that are here as well. There is one very particular one called the Plain View Doctrine. This is important because it basically defines objects that will be falling in the plain view of an officer who has the right to be in the position to have that view are subject to the seizure without a warrant and may be introduced into evidence. Basically, you may have pot on the table. The officer at the table or at the front door may not be able to see it. But if you allow the officer into your home, thus, if he's standing in your living room because you invited him there and he sees it, it's in plain view, thus it's allowed to be introduced as evidence. Three key criteria that must be met. The officer is where they are, has the legal right to be. Ordinary senses must not be enhanced by advanced technology in any way. And any discovery must be by chance. He glances over at the kitchen table and he sees the pot. That right there, as long as you invited them in, they had the right to be there. They're not using technology to advance their vision or anything. Uh, an officer wearing glasses, regular prescription glasses, that I guess kind of varied. Several states have very specific rules on that. But typically an officer can be wearing glasses, but they can't be wearing um, like video equipment that can zoom and things like that. But just regular glasses typically is fine. And when the officer glances at the table, they happen to just randomly see that there's pot there. Thus, it's by chance. 
the plain view doctrine is applicable in the digital forensics world uh, and it is being rejected. So do keep that in mind. Plain view doctrine in the digital forensics world is being rejected. There is no such thing as plain view doctrine in digital forensics. Example, in a case where police officers were searching a computer for evidence related to illegal drug uh, trafficking, the examiner observes a AVI file, a video file, and finds child pornography. He must get an additional warrant or an expansion of the existing warrant to continue the search for child pornography. The, even though he already found it, he's not allowed to keep digging for it because the original search warrant specifically dealt with illegal drugs. Thus, evidence collected for child pornography, if the warrant did not call for it, is no longer admissible. Hence, the additional warrant or the expansion of the existing one. Preparing for a search. Preparing for the computer search and seizure typically uh, is going to be the most important step of that investigation because there has to be a way done in such a manner where it can be re reproduced. To perform these tasks, you may need to get an answer from the victim and an informant. For example, is there a password? Who could be a police detective assigned to the case, a law enforcement witness, manager, so forth? Sometimes you're going to have to get approval to do your job before you continue. Again, part of that is working with your team and having someone that's on your team that understands rules and regulations as well as the law and following the organization policies and procedures that you're working under. When you are assigned a digital investigation case, start by identifying the nature of the case and whether it is involving private or public sector, and thus the rules that may be able to change based off of those uh, sectors. The nature of the cases dictate how to proceed and thus what type of assets or resources you'll need to be able to do the investigation. If it's a private sector, you're going to be using one set of tools and one scope. If it's a public sector, it could be a different scope, a different set of regulations. Again, for law enforcement, this step might be difficult because the crime scene isn't as controlled. So that becomes an issue. If you are able to identify the operating system and or device, you could possibly estimate the size of the uh, drive of the suspect's device and how to collect it. Again, it's all going to be circumstantial based off of the particular situation. Basically, the big thing here is you want to be able to determine the operating system and or hardware that's involved so that you can figure out the appropriate method for collecting that information and or data. So the types of cases and locations of evidence is going to be determined whether you can remove digital evidence because again, if it's a key critical server, you may not be allowed to seize the server without additional warrants or without an additional judge signing off of it, as opposed to being able to conduct your digital search for evidence on that device and then just being able to make a copy of that evidence. Again, verifying it's 100% of the original data. Law enforcement investigators need a warrant to remove computers from a crime scene. Basically, they have to have a warrant to be able to transport it, them to a lab where a private sector, you may not need a warrant based off of the rules and procedures and policies of your organization. So if removing the computer will irreparably harm a business, typically the device will not be taken off site. If it's going to cause harm to a business or an individual, again, additional precautions may need, may need to take place. There could be additional complications if their files are stored off-site that are ex uh, accessed remotely. If they're accessed in China and we're accessing them here, do you have the legal right to access them? Again, you're going to be wanting to verify with your lawyer on your team because, again, the different case laws that talk about the availability of cloud storage that is not located physically in the same location 
and how you are allowed to collect evidence in the cloud or if you're allowed to collect evidence in the cloud. If you're not allowed to take the computers to your lab, is there a way to determine the resources you need to acquire the digital evidence on location in a speed manner? Because again, our goal here is to get as much information as you can about the location of the digital crime, maybe look at potential hazmats or hazards. Do you have to have a hazmat suit? Do you have to have someone certified for hazmat on your team? If, if there happens to be a incident where there is a potential hazard and hazmat has to come into place, you're gonna to wanna to understand your organization's guidelines for hazmat. For example, putting the target uh, device in special hazmat bags, being able to quarantine the devices, again, following the appropriate hazmat procedures and policies, thus not to contaminate anything. Things like checking for higher temperatures. If we're looking at uh, devices, electronic digital or digital devices, temperature may be a concern, but by placing it in a hazmat area, it could increase the temperature and then could possibly lead to the destruction of evidence. But at the same time, if it's a biological hazmat, that high temperature could be there to, to kill the bacteria or that biological, so you may want it. Do you see the portion of situational here? It's not always black and white. There's a lot of gray here. Corporate computing investigations typically only require one person to respond to an incident, though that could vary. Where law enforcement may be a larger scale investigation. Law enforcement may designate a lead and thus uh, turn that into a larger scale investigation. Anyone assigned to the scene should cooperate with the appropriate lead so that they can uh, correctly investigate and or collect evidence. Using additional technical expertise is always important because sometimes a crime may happen in a digital or electronic device that you're not an expert in. Thus, trying to collect information on them may be a little bit harder. Thus, being able to bring in a technical expert may be the better call. For example, you may not know uh, things about different operating systems or RAID servers or database servers or Exchange. So you may have to be able to bring in other people that have those expertise. For example, you may be a Windows person and they're trying to get you to bring in uh, a Linux machine. We may not understand how Linux fully functions, so it makes more sense for you to bring in the appropriate expert to help you. Finding the right person, though, can be a challenge. Educated specialists and in investigation techniques is important because, again, here the goal is not so much an expert in that technology, but also an expert in that technology with the idea of preventing evidence being damaged and or destroyed. All right, so some of this gets a little bit more subjective because now we're going to start getting into determine the tools that you're going to need. So that's going to be really depending on your organization and their requirements. But I mean, let's go simple go bag. Create your initial incident response field kit. You want it to be lightweight, easy to carry, still adhering to your organization policies though. You can also create an extensive response field kit. This is going to be all the tools that you're going to need as appropriate for your organization when at a scene. Extract only those items you need to acquire evidence. Again, this is going to be based off of your uh, organizational policies very drastically because, again, some of these bags get expensive. Some of these tools get expensive. So you having them as, as, as a go bag may not necessarily be a good idea. It's going to be based off your organization, though. The tools could be, again, your forensics toolkit, a laptop, flashlight, camera, things to document. Some general tools could be things like a computer repair kit, the appropriate data cables, uh, log forms, notebook, computer, batteries, labels, tapes, pins, markers, bags, flash drives, so forth. Uh, could also be things like the appropriate initial response field kit 
as dictated by your organization. Maybe power strips, maybe gloves, maybe leather gloves, maybe rubber gloves, magnifying glass, paper, brushes. Again, all of this is going to be based off the organization and what they tell you you're going to have to carry. Again, same thing as that with flash drives, uh, converter cables, all of that. That's all going to be controlled by your organization and what they tell you is appropriate. So before you do your investigation, prepare your team. Review facts, plans, objectives, so that the team has a clear-cut view of what they know what they're going to be doing. So with that said, make goals. Make sure that digital evidence is volatile, meaning keep uh, skills to assess facts very quickly. That way, if you uh, have to be able to collect the digital evidence on the fly quickly, you know how to. Slow responses can cause digital evidence to be lost in certain circumstances, so do keep that in mind. Part of the goals should be, again, preserve the evidence, keep information confidential, and keep the integrity there. Define the appropriate secure perimeter. The, again, this is not so much for you. This is going to be more uh, for individuals at the scene. For example, law enforcement. Because again, you're not going to be taping it off. You're probably going to be having a security and or police person do that for you. Professional courtesy uh, or professional curiosity can destroy that evidence, so you do want to be careful with that. Involve police officers and their professionals who aren't part of the crime scene processing team should be removed. Things like automated fingerprint identification system, APHIS. I'm not quite sure why we're talking about APHIS while we're talking about securing a scene. But it's there. It's used for fingerprinting. Police can take uh, the eliminated uh, the elimination prints for everyone. But again, normally you have your team and you break it up so that everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, this is again assuming we're dealing with criminal, not so much private. Sometimes our author kind of forgets the to be clear on his uh, line of thinking. So all of this is dealing with the appropriate uh, criminal crime scene. All right, so we're going to talk about seizing uh, evidence, again, with a proper warrant. Corporate investigators may not have uh, the need for a warrant because they should have the appropriate authority as outlined by the policy or the corporation or organization that they're working for. But again, if we're dealing with seizures in criminal cases, even if a corporate investigator finds criminal items, they need to stop what they're doing because, again, the Fourth Amendment search and seizure uh, rights of individuals. So again, when seizing digital evidence for criminal investigations, we must follow the appropriate U.S. Department of Justice standards. Basically, honestly, if you're a corporate investigator and you're trying to do your investigation and you come across criminal uh, evidence or criminal uh, a criminal case or you're typically going to be stopping. You're not going to be doing your investigation. You're going to be contacting the police and following the appropriate policies thereafter so that you do not accidentally destroy evidence in a criminal court case or a criminal case. For the civil investigations, you follow the pretty much the same rules, but it requires less documentation throughout. Basically, again, talk to a lawyer. Preparing to acquire digital evidence is always a big one because the evidence to acquire the scene depends on the nature of the case and the alleged crime and or violation. Ask the appropriate supervisor for how you're going to be acquiring this data. Do we need to take the entire device? Can, do we only need the storage of the device? Are we allowed to remove the device or do we have to do it here? Are we allowed to take it back to our lab? If we are taking it back to the lab, do we have the appropriate paperwork to go along with it? And so forth. Again, ask your supervisor uh, 
the appropriate types of questions. Again, normally this will all be outlined, and you're not going to just be doing this willy-nilly. You're going to have a structure. You're going to have a plan, because organizations do not want their junior forensics investigators destroying evidence. So they're normally going to be paired with someone and or go through the appropriate training at your organization so you kind of know what to do. Guidelines. You're going to have some very specific guidelines. Typically, when I talk about guidelines, I also talk about how you should be documenting everything because, again, it's about someone asks you, well, how did you do this process? You have a documented path that you can show them. This is what I did. Step A, step B, step C, step C, so forth. They're going to talk about things like securing the scene. Again, this may be outside of your scope, but was the uh, scene secured before you were allowed to do the appropriate acquisition of the data? Again, professional and courtesies for onlookers, but again, you're not a police officer, so this really is not your area. Take videos and stills of the area. That way, we can always reproduce it later if need be. We're paying attention to details. Where the, where the devices were, where the devices found, where the devices found in conjunction with one another. Some organizations may even require you to sketch it out, not just do photos. Also, you may have to be uh, looking at details. Were the devices on? Were they off? What did you do? I mean, if we're talking digital uh, evidence and it's a computer, you may not be able to turn off power. So how do you be able, how are you able to collect the appropriate evidence while you are out on the scene if you want to do the, uh, the data collection or the acquisition of that evidence while you're at that location. Thus, you may have to have that go bag so that you have the forensics uh, items so that you're able to do your forensics investigation without having to power down that device. Oh, gotta love that, the guidelines. Don't cut the power unless it's an older operating system. That I'd be even more careful with. Again, organizational rules and policies first. Save the data from the current application as safely as possible. Record all activities. Take lots of notes. Document everything. Close application and shut down the computer if it's shown to be safe and okay based off your organizational policies. Again, a lot of things go back to those policies because you have to adhere to those rules before you move forward. Bag and tag everything. Normally, you assign one person to collect and log all the evidence. Photos are taken so that they can be reproduced later. Tag all evidence that you collected, current date, time, serial numbers, any unique features, makes, models, who was there, who touched it, everything that you can document, you're going to document. You're going to maintain two separate logs for collecting evidence. You're also going to maintain consistent control of the collected evidence. So if I collected it at on location and then I transported it, I'm going to show in documentation the removal of evidence, transportation, transportation, uh, removal of transportation into the lab, checking at the lab, and so forth. We're going to follow a very step or a very systematic approach to that evidence transportation from scene to lab. What you could also be doing while on location, looking for information. Part of the documentation, photos, and whatnot could be so if you have to break in passwords, passphrases, pins, if you're able to look around the uh, the suspect's desk, you may be able to find a sticky note that says password. Documentation, it goes a long way. That way you don't have to break into the password because, or to break into the machine because, again, that process is, again, altering the data and then certain states may or may not allow for it. Collecting documentation and media related to the investigation, that could be hardware, software, Backups, manuals, documentation, uh, CDs, DVDs, USB, external devices, and so forth. Again, understand your state regulations, understand your corporate policies or your organizational policies when it comes to these forensics investigations. All right, here is a key thing sparse acquisition techniques for extracting evidence from a large system. 
You're going to be extracting only data related to evidence of your case. That's what sparse acquisition means. You're looking for things just for your case. Drawbacks of this technique, it doesn't recover data in the free or slack space. So do keep that in mind. A technical advisor can help list the tools and the process needed uh, to process this very specific incidences and or crime scenes. Guides to about where and what the data is and helping the obstructed logs. All of that could be uh, brought forward by a technical expert. But again, individuals are not expected to know everything, but you are expected to know when you need help. Because again, you're not going to be an expert in all technology. One of the nice things is that these technical advisors, they can kind of help narrow the scope of a warrant by saying that you need these very specific items and you can itemize them in that warrant if a generic warrant will not suffice. I want to search for uh, all photo evidence on a suspect's mobile device. As opposed to, I want to search for all photos on all devices from the suspect. A judge may not like the general nature of the second item, but the item narrowed down uh, first option may be a little bit more doable by a judge. Because again, they're not going to just give you blanket uh, search capabilities. They're normally wanting you to be able to narrowly focus on a particular item. What a technical uh, advisor's responsibilities, their known aspect of the uh, seized systems, because again, they're going to have that expertise. They're going to help conduct the search. They're going to help document their uh, portion. They're going to help document the planning strategy so that the overall strategy that can be outlined and again documented. Helping secure the scene, probably not. Directly investigating uh, handling of sensitive materials, again, probably not. But the big thing here is they're going to they're going to work and they're going to document with you. So documenting evidence in the lab, basically we're recording all activities and findings as we work through it. We're going to be maintaining a journal as we process evidence. Our goal here is to be able to reproduce the same results uh, over and over again. Repeatability. When you or one another investigates, repeat the steps you took to collect the evidence, it verifies that you both did the correct steps. That way, if someone is trying to debunk what you did, if it's repeatable, you can give them the steps that you did and they should be able to do it with the same results. That journal uh, serves as a reference that documents the methods you used to process that evidence. You have to maintain the integrity of the digital evidence in the lab, because again, we're working off of copies, not the original. So again, steps to create an image, is you may create all image files to a large drive. You start your forensics tools to analyze the evidence. You're in the appropriate hashing, whether MD5 or SHA-1 hashing algorithm, on large image files to get a digital hash. You then secure the original media in the evidence locker. You, you lock it up and you verify your copy has the same hash value as the original. Storing uh, digital evidence, you can the media you can use, depending on how long you want to keep it. Are we talking CDs, DVDs, DVRs? I don't know why I said DVRs. CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, so magnetic tapes, so forth. The cost and lifespan are going to vary. Again, double check with organizational rules and policies to figure out how you're going to be storing long-term digital evidence. We can have also things like super uh, digital lining tape. That's just tape. Uh, you don't rely on one media. You normally have several just in case. You work off of two copies that again have been verified to be bitstream copies. And you may even use two different tools to create two different images. To help maintain the evidence uh, chain of custody, you're going to restrict access to the appropriate labs and storage, uh, storage lab area or the storage area thus allowing cameras and sign-ins. That way not anyone can access them. You're going to have a way to document that entire process. Cameras, 
because it's a little bit harder to say, well, I didn't sign in if on camera you're able to find video footage of the individual. You might need a retaining the appropriate evidence infidelity. <laughs> Definitely not infidelity. Because some evidence may, uh, may need to be kept long term. So again, you have to check with the appropriate state agency to figure out if you're going to be retaining evidence that long to make sure to verify that you are complying with all state compliance laws. Here is a retention and media storage uh, check-in sheet example. So how do we document? One of the nice things is you can use evidence custody forms that are predefined out there. A lot of organizations already have them freely available. An evidence custody form serves as very specific items. Identifies the evidence, one. Identifies who's handled the evidence from process all the way through. Lists the dates and times the evidence was handled and again by who. You can take one additional step if we're dealing with digital evidence. You may also include things like the appropriate hash values for that digital evidence as well. Also, part of that chain of custody could also include anything uh, or any, any detailed information you may need as a reference. Evidence bags are also included. Uh, they have labels, typically. And you can also have evidence uh, label bags that allow you to do additional labeling if necessary. If we're talking specific electronic device evidence bags, typically they're going to be specialized any static bags, but again, they're going to have the room for the documentation on the bags themselves. How do we obtain a hash? Since we already started talking about the SHA-1 and MD5 hash, hashes are typically a cycle redundancy check. It's a mathematic algorithm that's used to determine whether a file content has been changed, not considered a forensic hashing algorithm. MD5, or the message digest 5, is again a, a formula. It basically translates the file into a hexadecimal code value or a hash value. And thus, if a bit or byte in the file changes, it alters that hash value, which can be used to verify a file or drive has been tampered with or not. Three rules for forensic hashes. You can't predict the hash values. No two hash values are the same unless identical data. If anything changes in the file or device, the hash value has to change. Another type of hash value, since we already talked about MD5, is this SHA-1, or Secure Hash Algorithm Version 1. It's a newer hashing algorithm. It was developed by NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology. Both MD5 and SHA-1 uh, collisions have been occurred. Most digital forensic hashing needs to be satisfied with a non-keyed hash set, meaning there's a, a no key. A unique hash number generated by a software tool, such as like a Linux MD5 sum command. If we're dealing with Linux, we could do MD5 sum in the appropriate file, and that gives us a hash value. We also have what's called a key hash set, which is created by an encrypted utility secret key. You can use the MD5 function in an FTK imager because we can use the forensics toolkit done by Access Data Imager to obtain the appropriate digital signature of a file or an entire device if need be, which we're going to be doing this in our lab. Here is our drive slash image result with the appropriate sector count, hash count, hash being both MD5 and SHA. Let's move on to reviewing a case. General task you'd perform in any computer forensics case would be identify the case requirements, map out goals, map out a plan, plan your investigation, conduct, complete, and critique. Don't forget part of the completion is also dealing with the reporting functionality of it. We're going to get into a sample civil case. Most cases in the corporate environment are considered low-level in investigations or non-criminal cases. 
common activities and practices. Basically, we recover the appropriate files, a suspect's email, so forth. Very rarely may it require things like covert surveillance, but it must be defined within the company's policy if you're able to do it or not. If it's not outlined in the organization policies, it could be part of or increase the risk of uh, civil or criminal liability because if you're doing surveillance on your employees but you never gave them the appropriate uh, proper notification and or it wasn't clearly listed in the company's policies, you could be breaking their rights. Sniffing tools for data transmission, that's always a big one because you could be listening on the network and collecting data that way. All right, moving on to criminal, could be fraud, could be homicides. Normally you're gonna be dealing with a warrant. So again, way outside our scope. Sample criminal investigation, a computer cable connects to a computer and through a printer, through a wall. Uh, if it's in a different area, you may have to wait for a new uh, warrant to search the adjacent apartment, because I'm assuming these are two apartments. But again, all of this is going to be very specifically defined in your warrant scope. So you may have access to search one area, not another area. Again, pay attention to your warrant scope. Consult the lawyer on your team. Reviewing the background information for a case. Throughout the book, you've used data files. So we haven't really been doing the book portion. Uh, our, if you've been doing the exercises in the lab book, great. Not everyone has, but that's okay. We've been using a parent case. So the new startup company is uh, Art Patent Searches. A computer sold on Craigslist was discovered to contain child pornography. It was traced back to the M57 patents. So the employee is suspected of downloading the pornography. Then we have our investigation. We have the appropriate background information. We have the police because child pornography is a criminal case. They do the appropriate imaging, the uh, computers, the other machines, any flash drives and so forth. The police made the forensics copies of the RAM and the network uh, server from the M57 patent server. Then they actually conduct the investigation, and that's going to be outlined in our textbook. We could use the OS Forensics uh, tool to analyze that image file, which actually in class, we're actually looking more into some of those labs as well. And that's the end of this lecture. This was sadly not one of the longer ones for this book, but a lot of information kind of just pushed out. Understand digital evidence, understand sparsing, understand criminal versus civil, uh, corporate versus private, sorry, corporate slash private versus public versus government. Understand how to protect the safety uh, of yourself and the safety integrity of the data. Understand the guidelines for securing a scene. Understand the the appropriateness of searching and seizing of assets based off of organizational policies. And that's the end of this chapter. Thank you.